all. I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to read through a poem and then sort of do a little bit of background. Now, just out of interest, I'll put the poems up um, and I'll give you a bit of explanation as to how we got here. But if I trip over them, I'm either used to speaking or I'm used to VCing. I'm not used to doing both at the same time. And as everybody knows, blokes and multitasking are a bad combination. So um, let me start with a poem and then I'll talk to you a little bit more about the poet in residence. So this is called Time Walking. I walk through unknown paths as if in dreamscapes. Through mist, Mother Nature adds soft focus to the landscape. Am I lost or do I simply fail to see the landmarks, signposts and purple walkway markers missed? City towers of gleaming steel and glass evaporate. A century has slipped away from me. No traffic noise or aircraft howl pervades my peace. In the distance, can I hear the horns of ships as they navigate their way along the treacherous Thames? Or are the guns and sound of warfare from across the water? A locus of spirits. The memories of every body laid within this place, 200 years of London come and gone, lost but not forgotten, ingrained in every stone. I wipe away the leaves and winter debris, and there I see the history look back at me, inscribed in carved letters of love, husbands, sons, wives, daughters, uncles, aunties, cousins, friends, all remembered, all communing with nature, all once in a while brought alive as fog it isolates this special place from the commerce and the noise is now only now i notice the moisture on my face it has started to rain from the inside and i wipe away the years with the back of a glove the spell is broken the dead return to rest i wrote that at the end of the first year of the project that we've been working with initially ken um, and dan and then michelle and later susanna I want to talk a little bit about how I came to know the park, how I got involved, how we offered the service of a poet in residence and, and uh, read some poems and some events we've had during the year. Or oh, rather now nearly two and a half years, I should say. So I work in with, with a rather large bank in the city and I have been working in procurement and IT in various jobs for, for probably the last 20 or so years. I was working for one Credit Suisse, a Swiss bank for 15 years. And one day they said, we don't need you anymore. And um, I had some time on my hands and I had just written my first novel. And I needed to find whether or not it worked in terms of the timing, the location um, and things like that. So when I had lots of time on my hands, I walked to Pimlico and I walked to Mile End, which is where my two main characters were living. And I found Adam, my character's pub, and I found where he might walk his dog, and, and I found these strange people one Saturday in this graveyard in Mile End. Ken was there and other various other people, although I didn't know him at the time, and they were having an open day. And on the back of that, I modified the book to make it where my character would walk their dog. And I then published the book, I got a new job, two years went by. I then became permanent at my new bank. And the first week I had what they call a CSR day. So what you see all the volunteers coming along doing in their 10s, 15s, 20s, all through the year, helping out debriar and denettle the park. Uh, I'm not even sure that's a word, but we'll stick with that at the moment. And in that first week, someone said, we're doing a CSR day at this place in Mile End. Would you like to come along? I said, well, okay, what is it? Oh, it's a cemetery. And it turns out that my first week of permanent work, I did a CSR day at the cemetery. And people said, well, has anyone here got a link to the cemetery? I said, I wrote a novel with it in, does that count? And Dan and I had a little chuckle. And at the end of the day, I said to him, have you ever thought about having a poet in residence? Because I, I'm a writer and I've written for poetry for the last 20 or so years. And um, it, was, it was an interesting experience. We took about three months to come up with how it might work. I think Ken and various other people on the committee had to meet me, make sure I wasn't a complete psychopath um, and make sure that what I was producing was going to be helpful for the parks. So the idea was to try and use it for publicity and things like that. So what we agreed was a series of uh, every January, what we would try and write to once a month during the year 
and that I would come along to certain events. And it seems to have been a very comfortable thing after the first year we extended it. After the second year we extended it. This year it's slightly more difficult because I can't come. And we'll get to the end of the evening and I'll read a poem about how I'm looking forward to coming back to the park and being positive about this because we have seen some fabulous changes in people's behavior, whether or not it's permanent, but people have actually been nicer. And actually, I think one of the drivers out of this is if we can do this much for COVID, can we not do this much for the environment in, for, in future going forward? I think there's some lessons been learned here and we might have some more lessons to learn as a society. So I'd like to read two poems from the first year. Um, and the first one is about one of my favorite things is foraging. And I am a lover of all things slow gin and uh, things like wild garlic, which is coming out now. So this is called Forage. Have we forgotten all those lessons taught, tales from ailing grandparents who lived through the war, who braved the blitz, suffering the hardships of rationing through rabbit pie and foraging? Now we look on and see the New England, incomers remind us of our bountiful land. As it's always been, new faces and races, harvesting between the stones, augmenting their diet through bramble jelly and foraging. Spring arrives, the chefs are keen, seeking culinary differentiation. New flavours plucked from the living world, wild garlic, the zeitgeist, green leaves first, then white flowers picked while foraging. The seasons change, the larder remains full, nuts and berries, fronds and fungi, but care is needed, a keen eye for safety. Poison lurks within the lush living carpet. Take a guidebook while foraging. And here, in our urban wilderness, I bear witness to collectors, reminding us of all that nature shares, willingly renewing our link, our link to Gaia, a way of life through foraging. What's annoying is when you read your stuff and you put this presentation together in the week and you find the typos in your own work that you've corrected at some other point and they're not in the versions you've got on the screen. So any typos, any mistakes in my speaking, I apologize. I'm not a professional. Just something to note, Nelson, is that I don't know if you shared the screen on that occasion. So just for the future ones. Ah, okay, um, sorry. Uh, and that's, screen, my, that's, that's, that's my badness on, uh, on this tool. Let me share the next one, which is called Bookends. Uh, Bookends is about the fact that the park forms odd bedfellows. It forms odd relationships of people at the moment who don't, don't sit together. And we hope very soon they will start sitting together on park benches and talking and sharing their lives. So this is Bookends. Uh, can you now see my screen? Yeah. Yes, right, you can. good. So this is bookends. They sit, would be bookends, the bench, a sanctuary, a sepulchre, a place of meditation and prayer, respite from their wanderings. Our wishes to speak almost too British, but this is the melting pot, the cauldron. We can break the rules and converse, the weather safe ground as ever. A few words in and the scamper comes, tiny paws break more ice than words. The puppy, new to the outside world, feet far too big to be under control reminding both of children long grown common ground there is more than that than differences the color and creed blur from the view misunderstandings lost no one misconstrues they are one in the moment until joggers supply a rhythm to the birdsong symphony the bass notes while lycra slips and rubber grips fleet of foot and then they are gone two men left once more alone ruminating calculating the way of the world I like doing backdrop pictures with photographs I take from the from the, the, the graveyard the cemetery. And at the moment, one of the benefits of being in lockdown and having some wildlife around me is that I've got my camera out and I've been taking lovely pictures of nesting swans and nesting moorhens and woodpeckers and wagtails. And my sanity at the moment is a return to my childhood love with my mother of ornithology. I said that we talked about a lot of different themes. The park is a source of incredible inspiration. Um, and when I say that, I mean, 
the sort of themes we covered are seasonal, wildlife, flowers, reptiles, graves, the architecture of them, but also the history of the residents. And I got quite passionate about this in the first year, and I think it's something I'll come back to more this year, because I think there are some really personal stories written on gravestones, and you see family histories, not in one gravestone, but in several. You also see some architectural patterns. But there was one particular person in the park that I did write about in the first year that I, I would, would share now, and it's about, that's the, uh, the grave of Will Crooks. Will was an incredible guy who um, came through the poor house, in the end got all the way to parliament and changed the poor laws. And that's one hell of an achievement for someone whose father died uh, at sea when he was about two years old and he ended his, and, and spent his childhood in the poor house. However, he was a hero in the context of his time and some of his views now might be less than comfortable. So this was a difficult poem to write to get the value correct and, and understand that there is always a context in which we, we read and write things. A hero for his time. In modern times, we talk he of heroes lightly. Warhol's 15 minutes seems obligatory, but as Victoria reigned, the challenges were greater. Will rose from poverty via the workhouse. This set his mental mould to make things better. Taught in the poor school, he made weapons out of words. Bring hope to the toughest of lives. From shop boy to blacksmith, then Cooper, always learning, often speaking, then cast out for agitation. Raising funds for striking dot workers facing starvation, supporting the alien bill against immigration. Returning to his roots, he fought for reformation. His former workhouse made a model for the nation. Guardian and first Labour mayor of Poplar, a common man with uncommon goals. Parliament called, the public spoke. Will became just the fourth Labour member, rising to the heights of Privy Councillor, though his feet stayed firmly in the East End. Though a champion for the disadvantaged, today we might struggle with his language. To feel the feeble-minded as verminous rats seem bleak, but throughout his life he tended for the weak, and now he lays beneath the cold sod. Not millionaire's row, but his stone stands amongst the people. Will Crooks, local hero, will forever be home. It's difficult when he was making comments that these days would not be acceptable about the mentally challenged and the mentally disabled, but he felt he was offering a duty of care, and so it's, it's, a, difficult, it's a difficult piece. Year two, we took the park on the road. Um, so Michelle and I organised three poetry evenings. We have Carolina here who took part in the, in the three nights of poetry, which was great. And we got some great poems out of her. Um, and we then also, um, I wrote some things based on having conversations in the room with, with Carolina and some of her peers. Um, and it was the odd story. One of the things we did was just had some branches and some fronds on the table and it generated some poetry. And it's just a very short poem I want to read called Sparrow Larceny. I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry if this is a little bit cack handed, but uh, we will get there. Sparrow Larceny. It began with a furtive look sat upon that fence watching for danger. When the coast is clear, he swoops, speedy yet stealthy on a thieving spree the pampas plumage in his crosshairs. Diving like a stuka, he, heads the, he targets the head. A flying pass and the stealing begins. A beak of fluff and the powers back on, accelerating away back to the nest, building a home, packing for new life. But this is a suitable role model for the young chick to see. It's all about sparrow larceny. I like the idea of sparrows being thieves that steal to build an, a new home for their brood. Um, there were three more events I wanted to talk, to talk about in the summer and, e and autumn of the second year. Um, we did two walks, uh, one on, bizarrely, on the solstice and one on the equinox, which I think was not planned or it was very close those days. It wasn't planned, it just how it happened that way. The first one was a haiku walk. Um, for those of you who don't know what a haiku is, it's a 17 syllable Japanese poem. Uh, poetry form, I should say, uh, 575, although that's an English translation. And if you get it really technical about this, I will not 
I will not go into it in any great detail. It's used heavily. And one of the things we said on the poetry course is because we had some non-English first language speakers there, I don't want you to come to England and to write a sonnet. I'd much prefer you brought, if you have a poetry style from your own country, I'd like you to bring them with you. And people brought some of their own styles. There are Persian poetry, there's um, Italian, French, German poetry. There are, I think it's uh, Rilke's uh, um, famous uh, German poet, for instance. And, and of course the Japanese styles. So we, we tried the haiku walk because haikus are simple to write while you're walking along. You can all count on your fingers up to five, up to seven, and then up to five. And I, I'm going to read something now, which is not my work, but it's actually, and if I get this pronunciation wrong, I apologize. But it's Kalina Vancha, who's on the call tonight. And she wrote um, some, she wrote some haikus uh, on that walk or, was, or, or based on that walk. And I just want to read them out briefly because it's nice to share someone else's work who obviously then had an impact on me. And I think the thing about poetry is it should have an impact on you. Um, yeah. So these are the haikus inspired by the poetry walk. Rich tombstones line the path. The poor slabs crowded to the right, still separated in death. Plane trees shed their bark in strips upon the grassy ground. The children write their poems. I love grassy ground in that. That sounds so cool. Tiny flower, tiny purple flowers, like perfect orchids on a stem, a wonder in the woods. This lady really loves alliteration. Cup-shaped tiny blooms, revealing shiny green hearts, seeds for future flowers. Again, future flowers. These repetitions of sounds in words are a really great device to use in poetry. I have to actually skip back one because the other thing I was going to talk about is it's not all about poetry, but sometimes poetry generates things. Or well, we did um, an evening flower walk, which was very impressive um, with our resident doctor, um, which was fabulous. And it, it, we saw so many things that night and it, it's, it spurred, uh, spurred the following poem, although if, if I can actually find my mouse previous. It's called A Walk on the Wild Side. You would think after weeks of punishing sun that the graves would lay baked, naked. Little more than structural remains, devoid of the deep greens of growth. But one evening in July, we spy a plethora of wild flowers with discerning eye, our guide, a modern day oracle of delphiniums, pointing out each specimen with its pertinent features. And of course, we are not alone. The butterflies, so delicate, so slow as night nears. The squirrel's always busy with no sign of fear and the sly old fox who we chose to believe had not noticed us at all. This was our conceit as we walked upon his hunting ground. We left only footsteps as advised, collected the odd piece of strewn rubbish, cast carelessly among the ragworts, and then first stepping carefully across the rocky remains in a secret hollow, the unexpected guest. Atropa belladonna, the deadly nightshade, with black poisonous plums like dark tomatoes. We stand in awe and calculate the deadly dose, 30 for an adult, far less for an unfortunate child. Before moving on to fennel and teasels, cow parsley and cyclamen, transfixed by the abundance until the bell tolls nine. I'm just keeping an eye on the time because I realize I have a, uh, a target to read. I want to read two final readings and then close and I'll then ask for any questions. One of the things that got, I got involved with, which was I think probably one of the most stunning bits of action with the park was the hundredth anniversary of the armistice. And I got to read a piece of Rupert book out at the ceremony, which was incredibly moving. I'm used to speaking in public, but not on such a moving occasion. I have to say it even got me to, to read such powerful poetry on a day which meant so much to so many people. And I have army in my direct family. My son-in-law is a, is a reservist. Um, my father did national service and, and my uncle was a 25 year veteran. Um, so it meant quite a lot, but I wrote something which was modified from the year before about the 11th and what it means. And it's just called 11. And in the backdrop, you'll see the war memorial. 
We come to mark a celebration, an act of adoration and remembrance, those fallen to protect our nation against the fist of intolerance. Now what remains around this place, all members of the global race, each color, creed and orientation, place a red flower close to their heart and cry silent tears for faces lost. In the land of 10,000 monuments, we come home to commemorate, entranced by the history of this grand dame, one of the magnificent seven. She may be over 170, her face a little grimier than she would like, but inside is a history of London families, from Millionaire's Row to pauper sites, from names carved deep on our marble highlights, to others brought low by circumstance, all now enhanced by Mother Nature, taking back her own once more, providing habitats for all her creatures, a place of green worship. The trees whisper messages of mourning as a century of tales are shared on the breeze, sent out across the busy city that takes one day to remember. Let's be positive about all this experience of COVID. And I said earlier that people are actually, 99% of people are being nicer. And let's hope 98% of them carry on doing that afterwards. But already I'm starting to, to miss the park, to miss my friends there, to miss the opportunity to do some CSR days and some good hard exercise and, and actually nettle stings all the way up my arms, but let's not talk about that. But I wrote Emerging as, uh, as a, a, sort of a song to what I'm looking forward to when I come back. Emerging, I pine for the trees. Verdant reminders of a time we took for granted. They stand, stolid, solid, waiting for our return, unaware of enforced abandonment, distancing ourselves from nature as we follow instructions. I whistle for the wind, remember its ferocity and the intimacy of a single rustled leaf, high in the branches above. The elders and elms know better. They have seen disease before. I yearn for those walks where seasons changed in front of my eyes. They await me in my future, when we once again mass in public, taking back the urban wilderness, sowing the seeds of hope. I await the moment when I'll once again be mindful, but without the constant vigilance, when six feet is the height of nettles, not the separation from my fellow man, when souls emerge into our green haven. So to close, and to open up the floor for segments, uh, uh, sorry, for questions, I love poetry and I see it as the art of breaking the rules without breaking the rules. There are lots of poetic forms and you can either write with form or without form. But once you write with form, there are things you can do to try and break those rules. And it's at times like this, when we are confined, that we need ways of breaking our confinement mentally if we can't do it physically. And poetry is a great way of doing that. It's a great leveler. It's a great way of understanding very simply how you feel. And it doesn't have to be clever. It doesn't have to be fancy, but what it does have to be is shared. It has to be shared by people and it's then appreciated and people will get glimpses of you they never saw. What we all see is different and what we all feel and how we react to a poem is unique. So tell me what you see, think, hear and feel when you hear a poem. I'm going to stop now and see if anybody would like to ask any questions or make any comments. Well, I would first like to say thank you very much, Nelson. I thought that was really enjoyable and I, I really loved hearing your poems. So thank you very much. And yeah, any, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, you can put it in the chat, which you can press at the bottom of the screen, or if anyone wants to switch off their microphone and, and um, ask any questions, you're very welcome to. Or if anyone wants to share any of their poetry, if they've got it to hand, please feel free. Carolina, go ahead. Carolina. Hi, hi. Good to hey, see Carolina. you. Hey, Carolina. Hey. Hi. <laughs> I'm alright as well, actually. I, I, I think just to check in, basically. Um, that yeah, we've got opportunities to to hold on to because we are forced into this uh, moment and appreciating actually. The cleaner air, the more the birds that you hear more vividly, it seems. <laughs> and yeah. you know, so yeah, I think we can take something out of that and hopefully carry on for more, you know, 
for better sustain sustainability, you know, working and, you know, bring that into our future life, I think. Um, but yeah, sorry. So just the question now from your last thing has to be shared. So for me, poetry often is also good for me just to write it, to collect thoughts and collect, you know, feelings and whatever and put them down. So I don't know if I would agree to, you know, but what, what do you think from your opinion? Does poetry need to be shared? Has to be, basically? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's an interesting point. It depends why you write it and what you want to achieve out of it. If you don't mind getting people's feedback, then it's fine to share. I would say one thing personally, a, a few of you know who've, who've met me before, I'm quite open about my, my foibles. Um, I lost my father and my son eight months apart 20 years ago. And I felt poetry was a great release uh, and a great way of dealing with my emotions. And therefore, when we come into this difficult period of, of mental hygiene, shall we say, I've, used, I've actually written for mental health awareness as well. It is, is nothing to be ashamed of if you struggle during this time. If you don't feel like sharing it, but writing those words down on a page gives you release, that is more important than anything else in the world. It is about making you feel comfortable with you. And this is a perfect way of doing it. If you can turn that into a form that helps one other human being, then it's a reasonable thing to share it. If you don't feel you can do anything more than write it, then it's a beautiful thing in itself because it's given you a, it's given your thoughts and your feelings shape and form. Mm, is that a reasonable exactly. way? Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally I agree. And I sometimes maybe it's just the, the own shyness to take, bring something out, but actually once we've done it, like in your session, like it's, it's more than a year ago, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was last, it was last <laughs> January. So yeah. Yeah. So, and then it was actually really good to reflect and to, hear something back because people are usually generally are kind they're not like talking suddenly critical or you know so they're actually giving really kind feedback that's my experience so mm. and it was actually good to get it out and as you said yeah it's another step if you take it out as well and get feedback it's great to actually start writing poetry you need to actually edit it and one of the problems was i've been writing poetry for 20 years and for the first 10, I didn't ever edit anything. And I thought, no, it's written. And it's actually other people that got my poetry better by getting right. the feedback from them. I, I, it wouldn't work unless I got mm. feedback from people. And now I, I don't make the simple cliched mistakes that I used to make before because people, you know, whether you like my poem, poetry or not, it's, it's kind of ir irrelevant, but it's not what it was. And it doesn't go down the same paths as it used to because yeah. of, of, of good people's feedback. But I think the other thing to remember is if you, any of you feel nerves when you're speaking on here, I am part of the thing called Toastmasters. So I teach public speaking when I get a moment. And um, there is a, a line that says there's only two sorts of people who don't have nerves when they speak, liars and the dead. Everybody has nerves when they speak. Uh, a lady in Poland actually corrected me and said three sorts of people. Psychopaths don't have nerves either, but I was quite worried that she even knew that. So that was a little bit too much information. But everybody has nerves. And if you don't have nerves, you don't have enough skin in the game to care about what you're speaking about. So if you don't have nerves, then you shouldn't be speaking. It should be part of you care enough about this to be nervous. I'm nervous tonight. I'm red faced. And, you know, I speak in front of 400 people at a time. I'm still doing this and I'm still nervous because I care enough about this. I care about the park. I care about the welfare of, of, of Ken, Susanna and Michelle because they're people I interact with on a regular basis. And, you know, I, I want to make sure that the park is safe. The 31 acres of woodland in Tower Hamlets is safe for the people that need to use it. Therefore, this is important to me. And if I make mistakes tonight, I will feel bad. And you should care like that because otherwise, why are you doing things? Does that make sense? So Nelson, I just want to, we've got, thank you so much, Caroline. It was lovely to hear from you and it's so lovely to see you as well. We just got some nice comments in the chat and something that I totally agree with um, is that people are saying like how nice it is to hear it. 
I think it's a totally different experience than than reading it and I personally have never deemed myself much of a poetry person but actually hearing it has been such a lovely experience so thank you and um, some questions so Penny has asked she just wonders what inspires you more the nature or the history of the cemetery park or a bit um, of both I think it's a bit of both, but I, I think it's the variety that I've got. The, the park automatically gives me seasonality. Ken uh, specifically gives me a little bit of guidance when I get the seasons wrong, when I get the flowers wrong, when I get things like that. And that's incredibly helpful to get the accuracy of it. But the more time I spend in the park, the more I see. And I think the time I've been spending here where I can only go out once a day and I'm, I'm on the edge of wilderness so I can go for a walk and whatever it's given me a fresh set of eyes. And every time I come to the park, I swear I see something different. I see a different story. And one of the things about me is I'm, I'm a reasonable polymath. I've got an interest in a lot of things. And I think the park is such a fantastic thing. When I try to tell someone about the park, I get suddenly, I, the, almost the fourth comment I'll always make is, you've got 50% of all the species of butterfly in the country in the park. It's one of those stats that always comes up. The wildflowers, the birds, the trees, the dog walking, the history, and it's a fabulous place. I've now been to six out of the seven Magnificent Seven. I haven't got to the seventh one yet. And I still like our park, because it's our park. Yeah, lovely. Great, okay, so some more. Um, how do you start writing a, a poem? What is your process? That's what Phil asked. It really depends on what I'm writing about. I'm quite someone puts on I, I follow quite a lot of other bits and pieces I've written two uh, three three novels and I'm writing a fourth one I've kind of stopped on that at the moment when it comes to writing poetry people say do you get writer's block and I don't think people ever get writer's block unless they want to have writer's block there's always something to talk about I will literally write stuff down but sometimes I'll write it in a very formulaic way there are lots of things I think are really really sexy I'm sorry I'm of, of an age where I use sexy as a metaphor but it's if you show something like a villanelle or a terzanelle, you have a very, very rigid structure. It's a repetitious poetry form. And you have to have enough rhyming words at the end to make it work. And it has to rhyme. You can break those rules along the way, but it has to rhyme. You can use dissonance. You can use assonance. You can use soft rhymes, what they call female rhymes and male rhymes. But I think what you should do is get what you feel down about the subject and not let the form ruin the content. You can tidy the content up, you can tidy the form up later, but if you become too bold, too beholden to the form, you lose the feeling. I would like someone to walk away from a poem. So I used to write about my son Daniel every year on his birthday. And, and, and that was what I did because it was my way of coping. But I got to a point where the poetry got better than the coping mechanism. It got to a point where I could actually relate to it. And when I share it with other people, I want... I want the person to have a reaction and I can't have that if I become mechanistic in how I write. So I have to write the feeling first and then put in some of the form later. Does that make sense? Yeah. Lovely. And people just generally comment in on how lovely they're liking this. Some people said they felt apprehensive, but they're absolutely delighted and they love the poetry. So really, really great. And just one last question that we've got from, from Jim is, do you find it easier to write whilst out and about rather than indoors? And we've only got about a minute, Nelson. No, um, I, I generally write on a computer all the time. I used to have this ongoing battle with my OU tutor. She said, why haven't you got a pen and paper with you? And I've written more poems in my head than I've ever written down. And I only, only ever capture fragments. I'm always writing things in my head. And so I probably only get about 50% of that ever down. I should use a dictaphone, I should use other things, but I don't. Um, I would love to write more when I'm out and I might start using a dictaphone more often. If anybody wants anything written for them during this time, uh, Michelle will have the contact details. Feel free to send ideas through. I'm happy to work with collaboratively with anybody if they want to have some fun. There's lots of ways of contacting the outside this. So just contact details to me if you, if you, want, if you want to write something with me. Yeah, and if we'll anyone wants to send us a poem, if they felt inspired tonight, please like send it to our Perfect. Facebook, on Messenger, or to our social media. So thank you, everybody, so much for joining. It's been a really, really lovely evening again. Um, 
and yeah please just keep an eye out we've got new more talks coming up Suzanne is doing the next one in on gardening in small spaces so it'll be lovely to have you join us so we just hope everyone's taking care of themselves and we miss you all and thank you for coming thank you, you Nelson thank you